Camouflage is often a matter of life or death in the wild. This footage shows some clutches of eggs in Zambia and South Africa that have been spotted by predators, such as this cat-like genet, or these banded mongooses which were caught on our motion-triggered cameras. I'm Dr. Jolian Trishanko, and I'm based at the University of Exeter in the Sensory Ecology and Evolution Group. My research revolves around the fundamental bioscience of animal vision and signalling, a field called sensory ecology. Together with Jared Wilson Agarwal, I'm working on a project co-led by Dr. Martin Stevens at Exeter and Dr. Claire Spotterswood at the University of Cambridge, investigating how camouflage works in the real world. Studying camouflage has lots of practical applications. The military is the most obvious, where being well hidden can all be a matter of life and death. But there are many others, such as concealing ugly buildings, telegraph poles or mobile phone masts. Then there is the long history of collaboration among biologists and artists in camouflage work. And of course a better understanding of camouflage can be turned on its head and used to make objects stand out from their background, as we might want to do in advertising or road safety. We use ground nesting birds as our study system. These birds rely on camouflage to survive because they nest out in the open where a host of natural predators, like this cheeky vervet monkey, try to find and eat their eggs. We set up these cameras and captured this amazing footage to find out what the birds' natural predators were. We can then use special photographic techniques and computer models to simulate how different predator species with different eyes and visual systems actually see these birds to better understand what aspects of the eggs or birds' camouflage and background affect their survival. But amazingly, we still know very little about what types of camouflage are most important in the wild and how they affect survival. In the natural world, it's very difficult to find a study system where you can link predation with the effectiveness of an animal's camouflage, partly because camouflaged animals are so hard to find and keep moving all the time. We chose to study ground nesting birds because not only does their nest survival depend critically on its camouflage, but also because their nests are vulnerable and open to passing predators, as they sit on the same spot for the few weeks it takes for the eggs and chicks to develop. We mainly use two groups of bird species with contrasting life strategies. The first group, the nightjars, are ghostly birds that forage for insects on the wing during the night. During the day, they sit tight on the ground and are incredibly well camouflaged, as you can see, or perhaps not, as the camera zooms in. Can you see the birds yet? No? There it is. This is a fiery neck nightjar. As you can see, they use their incredibly well camouflaged bodies to protect their eggs that they lay directly on the ground, making no nest at all. You can sometimes walk right up to them and they don't flinch until you almost step on them, within a meter or so. In contrast, our second focal group, the plovers and coursers, run off as soon as they spot a predator. You can see that here when the swimmers get too close for comfort for this three-banded plover. With no adult to protect it, the egg's camouflage comes into its own. It's the only thing between life and death for the chicks developing inside. When we find a nest, we take photos using cameras in normal visible light, at 10 meters, 5 meters and 2 meters. Then depending on the species, the bird flushes. Here you can see me lining up a controlled picture with a grey standard in the foreground. That's the little grey disc. Even though we only took photos when it was sunny, there are still big differences in lighting depending on time of day and atmospheric dust and moisture. This grey standard allows us to control for these lighting differences. Then we take pictures of the eggs at one meter, as well as an aerial shot and a lower shot to take in the views of different predators, circling birds versus stalking mongooses for example, and to include different spatial scales. In addition to normal light, we also take images in ultraviolet light, or UV. In this UV photo picture of a Mozambique nightjar, the violet colour corresponds to parts of the body that reflect UV light. UV light is very short wavelengths that the human eye can't see, but that many other animals such as many birds, mammals and reptiles and insects can. Most humans are trichromatic, meaning we see the world in three colours, red, green and blue, which is much the same as the Zambian vervet monkeys and baboons. That's why the red, green and blue diodes on a TV computer screen are enough to reproduce all the colours that we can see. But birds are probably tetrachromatic, 
seeing deep violet or ultraviolet in addition to red, green and blue. When we take a picture in UV, we can convert this image into a view that other animals would see, so we can analyse how eggs would look from the perspective of a bird of prey, or to a monkey or a mongoose. The modelling is computer based, and to do it we need to know the sensitivity of the camera and the animal's eyes to different wavelengths of light. Then we can convert the images across from camera vision to animal vision to simulate how the light receptors or cones in an animal's eye would detect the colour, even though in the case of UV we can't imagine what that colour would look like to an animal's brain. This research requires knowledge of how visual systems work in different animals. This is also why we need the hidden cameras, so we know which predator's vision to simulate. It's therefore really important to know your camera inside out. We spend a lot of time calibrating our equipment and writing new software to undertake our modelling of vision. When analysing the images, we use custom software to quantify the eggs' colours and patterns and compare them to the background at lots of different scales. This way we can see how the subject, an egg in this case, changes appearance with the background within a few centimetres, then metres. Then we can test how it looks across different habitat types, so we can see how well tuned the egg camouflage is in various environments. We are able to model all sorts of different visual properties in the images. Things like colour, brightness, contrast differences and the amount of edge disruption. This example shows how we measure pattern differences. Here's a crown plover egg where we filter out all but the very finest details. Black and blue regions show where the egg has strong patterns at each scale. We can then see whether the background has patterns at a similar scale. At this point we attempt to answer the key questions about what makes good camouflage. Whether the crucial feature of an egg's camouflage is its colour or its pattern or brightness. Or to what extent its outline is disrupted by strong markings like these. We can also test whether the birds specifically choose nesting sites with a background that makes their eggs look as camouflaged as possible. We can also learn a lot about comparing the strategies of different species. The fiery neck nightjar you can see here lays its eggs under the canopy of trees under dappled light. In contrast, the Mozambique nightjar lays its eggs in open areas of burnt grassland. Comparisons between species like these allow us to ask how specialised camouflage is to different habitat types. Plovers and courses are easier to spot as they run away from their nest. Here's a couple of crown plovers foraging on a hot day. This wattle plover is dive bombing a water monitor lizard that got too close to its eggs. And this one enjoying a more mellow dip. Then there's the Temix courser, which runs so fast that it's hard to keep up with the camera. And the bronze wing courser, whose chicks look like burnt clumps of grass. It's a nightmare when the GPS says you're winning a couple of metres of the chicks, but you can't see them amongst all the other clumps of burnt grass. Overall, we sampled more than 250 nests, in total across Zambia and South Africa, with about 12 different target species, and we took about 16,000 pictures in total. The nests in Zambia were all found by a team of Zambian nest finding assistants, who are brilliant field ornithologists, and have worked with my colleague Claire Spottiswood for many years, helping with a variety of research projects. They're amazingly good spotters, and eventually managed to outwit the nightjar's camouflage. We pay them for each nest they find, which supplements their livelihoods as farm labourers. A world away from the baking heat of the Zambian dry season, here on the west coast of South Africa is the charismatic Kitzlitz plover. You can see here that it does a little dance on its nest to cover up its eggs with material collected just around the nest. It's the only one of our study species to do this, and it's very interesting because there's this trade-off between just leaving the eggs uncovered or performing this dance, which is fairly conspicuous once you get your eye in. In South Africa, there is also the chestnut banded plover, which is quite rare and camouflaged in grey on the windy beach here, and the blacksmith plover. Our cameras showed blacksmith plovers destroying the nests of any kitlets plovers too close to their own, so the kitlets camouflage needs to not only work against predators, but also bullying competitors, which we saw on quite a few nests. In South Africa, many of our plover eggs were taken by pied crows, as you can see here. Their numbers are increasing rapidly as they expand further south perhaps because of increased urbanisation, and their growing numbers had a drastic effect on our focal species. Of 36 Kitzlis plover nests we found, only two survived to hatching and we suspect that the pied crows were a major source of predation, along with water mongoose and the five-toed otter. In South Africa there is also the white-fronted plover that lays its eggs on the beach, 
which is terrifying because the beach is made of mussel shells, so it sounds like you're crushing eggs wherever you go. However, you can see that there are other dangers to laying your eggs on the beach. Overall, we found from our hidden cameras that predation events are very, very rare. This, along with complex modelling, was one of the reasons why this was such a difficult project that has never been done before. And of course, the cameras ended up being attacked and disturbed on numerous occasions. That's just part of filming in the field, where you can't control all the variables like you can in the lab. Like all fieldwork, ours can be frustrating at times. There were times when we couldn't find any new nests, or when it clattered over for a few days, so we couldn't take photos. Then there were potential dangers too, walking across baking hot ground all day in the sun and returning to a piping hot car, often above 45 degrees centigrade. Then there were the dangerous and alarming roads, bushfires and insects like the South African swarm. And of course there were snakes. I nearly picked up this beautiful but venomous boomslang as I cleared a fallen branch from the road. There were also plenty of aggressive and deadly black mambas in the area, but thankfully we didn't encounter any of those. But overall the fieldwork went surprisingly smoothly. We saw some brilliant sunrises getting up early to do the fieldwork, and we documented some amazing examples of camouflage while we were in Africa. Like these insects. Or this praying mantis devouring a meal. Thankfully many of our nests did survive to hatching, and we sometimes even caught them in the act. Like these three banded plover chicks that can stand and run just a few hours after hatching. A little unsteady at first though. We also photographed chicks when we could, to see how the optimal camouflage strategy might change through different life strategies. We used the weight and time of photography to judge the chick's developmental stage. Back in the lab in Cornwall, we're still processing the images. Each photo takes a few hours to prepare and process. Some preliminary data show that plovers and courses might be able to select patches of ground to nest on that match the patterning of their eggs, and that there appears to be a trade-off in egg colour between concealing your eggs to avian predators, like the bushrite you can see here, and concealing them from mammalian hunters. We are analysing the data now to find out the mechanism behind all this, but for now it seems you can't fool everyone all the time.